but <laughs> you can see. So this is a little American alligator. It's not a crocodile. Okay, here we go. Here's a couple more. In fact, one of them just flew. Bald eagles have become a pretty common sight here in the Low Country, but you know that hasn't always been the case. Researcher Tom Murphy has watched this species go from almost extinct to pretty abundant. Tom, thanks for joining us today. You're welcome, Tony. Uh, we've been working with the birds for a long time. This is actually the 40th season that uh, I've been studying bald eagles here in South Carolina. We flew for two years doing aerial surveys looking for nests, and we could only locate 13 pairs of eagles in so, the state. In the so in state. the entire state of South Carolina, 13 pairs. Yeah, 1977. And uh, when I retired a few years ago, we were up to 253. And you imagine to see more than that now? Yeah, we think there's probably 400 nests in the state now. Oh, that's a great success story, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's uh, hard to, to really realize how close we came to losing the birds as, as a nesting so species. So what were the what were the real causes <laughs> for the birds disappearing? In the background, it was, it was a lot of shooting mortality, a predator control mentality. But then what really tipped it over was uh, the contaminants from DDT uh, causing eggshell thinning and, uh, and no chick production. And we know that that was true in our pelicans. Uh, we didn't, don't have any data for the, for the eagles, but we assume that they had the same thing. So Tom, DDT was a really common pesticide used all over the United States, right? It was, it was developed during World War II. And after that, it had widespread use all over the United States. And it's really persistent in the environment. Yeah, it lasts for years and years in the environment and has many uh, byproducts. And one of those byproducts causes the uh, calcium apparatus in birds to uh, malfunction, so you get very thin shelled eggs, which usually are broken before they ever hatch. So Tom, we have an active eagle nest right behind us, don't we? Right, we're uh, about halfway through the nesting season this time of year, and uh, that's a very typical nest, and you see it's very large. And the reason for that is that uh, the chicks are different ages because the female starts to incubate the egg as soon as it's laid, so there may be a weak difference in the age of the chicks. And what that means is the smaller chick has to be able to get far enough away from the other chick that it doesn't get pecked. And that's one of the reasons for having the large nest. And also you got two chicks eventually, each will have a six and a half foot wingspan. So you got 13 feet of eagle wings in that nest. And when they practice flying, they can knock each other out. So again, the large nest uh, facilitates keeping the birds in the nest along with mom and dad. What would you guess this nest weighs? Uh, most of these nests look like they're about four or five hundred pounds, but uh, there was one that was recovered after the nest tree fell that was over a thousand pounds. And the, the adults continue to put new material in them every year, right? Yeah, they'll stay in the same nest and in the same tree as long as that tree is healthy. And they add uh, sticks every year and they add sticks all the way through the nesting season. But that's uh, a flat platform on the top of that nest, Tony. It's not like a robin's nest. It's, you know, concave. and. Uh, it's all lined with Spanish moss and grasses and stuff like that. So uh, when, we, when we were banding, you could sit in an eagle nest and feel very comfortable. So Tom, you've actually climbed, well, a lot of these trees to get inside the nest, right? Climbing to the nest is actually relatively easy. Uh, getting around the nest sometimes is difficult. And uh, once you're in the nest, it's quite comfortable. But of course, what you were doing is monitoring the nest, checking on eggs, and, and gaining important information so that we could take care of eagles. Right? Yeah, what we were doing, we, for six years we banded uh, eagle chicks, and we were doing that in order to determine how old they were when they first reproduced. And the other thing was to know whether our birds that fledged from here will actually come back here to nest. Uh, we didn't really know that at the time, and it turns out they do. They come right back to South Carolina, even as juveniles, and eventually wind up nesting in, in South Carolina. Well, Tom, I know this nest is active, but I don't see much activity right now. Yeah, the chicks aren't large enough to be seen uh, quite yet. Another couple of weeks we could, but there are other nests on, on the property and we can go check those out. Let's go check one of those out. Yeah, Tony, this was the only nest uh, on the plantation that got blown out during the hurricane. And the birds have rebuilt a, another nest now. So these are not eggs, but probably chicks, right? Yeah, well, she's sitting up so high, uh, and indicates that she's brooding chicks rather than incubating eggs. And so will she actually sit and cover them up, or will she? She'll sit over them, uh, so she's protecting them from hot or cold. Okay, so these, these guys are four weeks old or so? 
I would say that it's probably coming up on uh, four weeks because she's still brooding them, so they're still young. So how much longer before they start to, well, how much longer before they fledge? Well, they'll fledge in 10 to 12 weeks, and that's okay. from a small chick up to a full-sized eagle. Like you always say, you know, a, a baby eagle, a young eagle that's ready to fledge is full size. That's right. They're fully grown. Uh, actually, their flight feathers are, are longer than the adults. And the babies lack that beautiful white adult coloration, right? Yeah, they don't have the white head or the white tail until about three and a half. Uh, also, the eye is dark and, and the bill is black. So, Tom, once they fledge, they, they, they're not feeding themselves for a while, right? No, it's about four to six weeks where the adults continue to feed them. And uh, they're seeing the adults fly in with a, with a fish and they'll uh, do a, a begging call and then the adults will come over and feed them. And they don't make any attempt to catch anything. They don't have to learn. What they have to do they is just build kind of sit a muscle there and scream tone. and expect stuff. That's to right. Be... And then they get, you know, kind of bratty, and I guess it's time for the adults to leave. And, and the adults will actually kind of get them to move out of the territory eventually, right? Yeah, they, you know, they just leave, and then the young birds just start wandering around. You know, that's a transition in its own where it's real difficult for the, for the birds to survive oh, because absolutely. they're learning, absolutely. learning to feed on their own. Eagles eat. I know, of course, we know they eat fish. What else do they eat? Well, coot is another, one of the primary sources when they can get it. Uh, it's not, a coot is not really a duck. It's a member of the rail family. And of course they eat a lot of dead fish too, right? Right, they are scavengers. Uh, well, I know I saw an eagle swoop down in a very busy highway one time and try and get, get a possum or a dead raccoon or something, obviously a roadkill. And that scares me because obviously there's a chance of highway mortality. Yeah, we're seeing more and more of that. What are some of the other perils that eagles face today? Uh, with the young birds or in, in, on a nest site, great horned owls can be a competitor, and owls will actually take an eagle nest away from them. Okay, so I've seen eagles kind of flying all kinds of acrobatics, and that's typically related to mating behavior, right? Primarily, sometimes it's defensive, but uh, a mated pair will come together and maybe lock foot to foot and cartwheel through the air. And, and falling out of the sky, right? Yeah, they'll, they'll plunge, they'll lock up both feet and just come down at high speed, and at the last second, they'll break off God, that's just incredible stuff. They, you know, they cruise at about 55 miles an hour, but they, they can accomplish speeds over 100 miles an hour when they're in the stoop. Do they really mate for life? As far as we know from our banded birds, which we followed through their entire breeding career, we've never had an eagle disappear from a territory and then show up somewhere else. So we do think that in a normal situation, they do mate for life. And if one of the adults is killed, so what happens then? It doesn't matter whether it's the male or the female, the, the remaining bird will stay on the territory and uh, maintain it and recruit in a replacement. And this nest is, I mean, this one's in a dead tree. That's not typical, right? That's very atypical. Uh, it's very rare we see them in, in dead trees. Uh, but after Hurricane Hugo, we started seeing a little bit of it. And then occasionally, because of the limb structure, they'll, they'll accept that. But, but the idea is the nest is pretty heavy. And if it's in a dead tree, it might fall out. As That's correct. As opposed to a living tree, which would presumably support a lot more weight. It does, and it'll, it'll have a greater longevity. Obviously, this nest is not gonna last but a couple more years. So, Tom, how are eagles doing here in the low country now? I never thought you know, 40 years ago that the recovery would be this quick, but uh, once we got DDT banned and uh, the shooting mortality went down, recovery occurred rather rapidly, maybe more than 10% a year increase. Well, I'll tell you what, we appreciate the work that scientists like you are doing for eagles here in the low country. Well, we spent a lot of time with them and uh, enjoyed doing it. This is Stephen Chabel, and he's the education director for the Center for Birds of Prey. Stephen, thanks for letting us come oh, oh, today. Great to have you, Tony. First of all, uh, pardon all the water. We've had a little bit of rain. Yeah, we're last couple of days. we're standing in about six inches of water, aren't little, we? Little little slushy, but uh, that's that's tropical South Carolina for you. Um, <laughs> thanks for thanks for coming out. All right. Well, t tell us just a little bit about the mission of this facility. Excellent. Yeah. So we're um, a, a nonprofit organization started back in 1991, and our focus is on understanding our world through birds. So the mission as it reads is to identify and address environmental issues through treating birds in medical care, through educating people about birds of prey, through research revolving around birds of prey. We know that because of their nature, because they're everywhere we go and they're sensitive and conspicuous, birds are great indicators of environmental health, especially the ones at the top of the food web. So we do a lot of different things under one roof. Um, my job is to teach people about birds of prey. When we started, there was a need for caring for birds that had been injured in the wild. We see birds that come in having been hit by cars, having been shot, having been poisoned, almost entirely human-related activities causing the problems. And what we realized was that um, 
treating the birds is great. Helps some of those birds go back out into the wild. Helps us to identify what the problems are. But really, if we want to get to the root of the issue, we need to help people understand that they're a part of the problem and also a part of the solution. So education grew very quickly out of that initial uh, medical care for birds. Okay, I think the first thing we're going to do is go visit the clinic, right? Absolutely. I think we've got a bald eagle who's in treatment over there, so we should go over and, and check that out. Okay, sounds good. So, Tony, I want to introduce you to our director Hi, of our medical clinic, nice Debbie Monty. Hey, Debbie, how are you doing? Thank yeah, you for letting you? us do this today. Thank you for coming. And so, uh, obviously, we have a bald eagle. Who's we this? Do. We do. This is an adult male bald eagle that we found in March. He was in the Francis Mary National Forest, unable to fly, and uh, we brought him, we captured him, brought him to the clinic and determined he had a luxated left elbow, which means dislocated. Is there something I can do to kind of help with this Absolutely. today? Absolutely. We're going to anesthetize the bird. That's a good idea. Get, yeah, it's For a good makes, first step. Makes our work a lot easier and get an x-ray just to determine um, what condition the elbow joint is in at this time. And this is all you want to do. You want to between your index finger and third finger, grasp the bird's head, and then hold the mask here. Okay. All right. And now we just wait quietly for him to go to sleep. God, it's just amazing animals. All right, so I think this bird is completely asleep at this point, and we can begin our Okay. Procedures. So if you feel this elbow joint right here, take your thumb and your third finger down there. And oh yeah. You feel it's a little thick right there. Mm -hmm. Well now compare it to this one and you should be able to feel the difference. Oh yeah, big, big difference. Right. The tissue is inflamed. Alright, and so what we're going to do for, to give him a little bit of physical therapy, yep, switch check, that. check the range of motion. Okay. I'm going to grab the wrist and the elbow and it's so it's so interesting, and you know, you look at a wing like this, and it's right. you kind of think of your own wrist and your own elbow, exactly. and it's kind of the anatomy is actually identical to ours. Yeah, but it, on a wing, it just looks yeah, really different. It doesn't looks it? very different, but yes, it's the same. So this is his wrist. These would be his fingers. Right. Um, he has a radius and ulna, just like we do, and then he has a humerus, and it all connects to the elbow here. And so I just want to make sure this joint doesn't slip or have any crepitus or any unusual movement when I extend it. How does it feel? It feels nice and stable. So I, I, what other kinds of birds do you guys get? We do all birds of prey native to South Carolina as well as shorebirds and pelagic birds. I, I sent you an anhinga one time and I think I was it stabbed me about 20 times yeah, between the time that. I got yes. caught it and the time I brought it into yes. you guys. Anhingas will do that. But do you were telling me a little bit earlier, so what, you know, what are the typical birds that come in? What kinds of injuries? So if you right. get a raptor, what, what has right. typically happened to it? Very often, about half of our birds come in due to collision. With, that's most often from a car, but it could be a window or um, a radio tower. The other half are things that we can't even imagine. I've been doing this over 20 years and I think I've seen everything, but every day is different. Yeah. Um, birds come in with, uh, you know, a tiny little piece of rope, uh, an anhinga had hung in its, the tip of its beak and he was starving to death because of one little tiny piece of rope that was on the ground. And you told me, you were talking to me earlier about lead poisoning too. Yeah. So they sometimes ingest, is that from ingesting They do. Lead? lead poisoning is becoming more and more of an issue. Almost 70% of our eagles that are admitted uh, are suffering from lead poisoning. We can treat it with chelation therapy and we're very successful if we catch it early enough. Uh, but the eagles get lead poisoning from ingesting most typically uh, gut piles that are left behind and they would eat the lead fragments and ingest them and then because of their physiology they break down the oh, lead. Okay, so the animal shot with buckshot or something exactly. they, and they eat. Exactly. Yeah, that's... So now we're going to put him on a, a board and get a radiograph. So we've completed our medical procedures with this bird and now we're going to give him oxygen to wake him up slowly. So, so I've got his little we have the oxygen, oxygen mask on. Yeah, the, definitely. Uh, eyes are open. Yeah, the and, eyes are opening under and, there. We keep the blanket. head covered during this stage um, to reduce the stress. And you can imagine if you're waking up from anesthesia, bright lights in your eyes is not what you want. So hopefully this bird's going to continue to improve. 
and then yes. it's going to be yes. released. Everything looks great on him. Um, I feel very confident that he's going to be a successful release. Makes us very happy. I'll tell you what, I mean, not only do you guys get to work with cool animals like yes. this, but yes. you have success stories with these birds actually yes. are released. and that is the heart of our work. And so, I sure appreciate what you guys do thank for you. all of us and for these me. birds. So, <laughs> I kind of feel like I should be looking over my shoulder a little bit. I, I don't think you have much to worry about. Um, like most wild things, they see us and they want to be somewhere else. Even. These birds that are, are quite used to being around people. These are birds that have been with us for over a decade. Both of them birds that were injured in the wild that couldn't be returned to the wild as a result of their, their injuries. But what they do is they help us to teach people about what's happening out there. And uh, they're, they're really great ambassadors. You know, the thing that's so great about people being able to visit these birds and see them up close is we've all seen eagles, and many of us have seen eagles. But when you're this close, you realize just how big a bird this yeah, is. Absolutely. I mean, they yeah. are impressive. It's, uh, it's something that uh, being able to get close to the animal, have a, an experience with them in a different plane than most people would normally have the opportunity, that's a, a great thing. And it also opens the door for us to talk about the things that are, uh, that are perhaps a little less pleasant. They're facing issues from uh, collision with car to gunshot to lead poisoning to you name it, these bad things are happening out there and we're seeing it first through these birds, which is... But important. it's important to point out that eagles have come back quite oh, a bit. Absolutely, they're, we start most of our tours right here in front of these eagles and, and one thing we can talk about is how they're a great success story. Can't help but notice how bright yellow the feet are. Oh yeah, they're, uh, they're, that's one of those sort of hallmarks of the bald eagle, that bright yellow beak and bright yellow feet. We see yellow feet in a lot of the birds of prey, especially the, the bird eaters, uh, but in the eagles, Eating fish gives them plenty of, plenty of carotenoids, I guess, in their feet to be bright yellow like that. So what else are you going to show us today? Well, we've got 50 species of birds of prey here at the center from all over the world. Why don't we go have a look at some of those? Sounds good. So tell you one of the really cool things we have uh, the opportunity to do here is show people trained birds of prey in flight up close. And we've got one of our trained birds here. So if you want to... Okay, I've got this here. little piece of... Yep. Put it right here. And she comes. Oh, that was great. So, this is a red-tailed hawk that was hit by a car and was left blind in one eye, but she can fly, which is really cool to be able to show people something like this right up close, whereas in the wild, they might only see them from half a mile. Away. I think she's kind of looking me over to see if I have something else. Yeah, yeah, they, they do learn quickly, um, and it is based on positive reinforcement. They know that if they do what we ask them to do, they're going to get rewarded. And th this way, you know, kids and anybody in the public gets a chance to see a bird fly see like it, this. See it fly right and it is impressive, oh, I mean. Without question. One of the birds that we spend a lot of time talking about, one of my favorites, are the vultures. Um, we have a black vulture today. Megan's going to bring him in uh, from over here. A lot of folks see vultures and they immediately kind of get oh, turned I just, off. I love it. They're they fantastic. Are, they are amazing birds, highly intelligent. And when we think about them in terms of importance, these guys are, are critical to our environment. These are um, not only a scavenger, but a scavenger that doesn't really cost us anything in the process. There are lots of animals that would gladly eat dead things if, if they were available. You know, the eagles we saw and rats and dogs, but vultures do it very efficiently. This is a bird that's actually a human imprint. Somebody found him as a hatchling and took him home and fed him, and that's why he can't be released back into the wild. He essentially thinks he's a human. Close to a five foot wingspan on the black vulture and he weighs a full two kilos, so almost five pounds. That's, that's big in bird terms. Uh, one of the largest birds that we work with here at the center. Well, Tony, we've got a really exciting opportunity for you guys today. It just so <laughs> happens that we have an eagle that needs to be released. Uh, this is Jim Elliott, our executive director. Jim, thanks for doing this with hey, us. This is man. exciting. I'm glad the timing worked out this way. This is some of the best part of what we do. So tell me a little bit about this bird. So obviously it's ready to go. It is ready to go. It's been in a flight enclosure and building the endurance that it needs to go and uh, give us the confidence to send it away. But it's a bird that came from Beaufort County. Um, he is an adult. We suspect a male because he's relatively small for eagle. But no real overt injuries, but it looks like he was in a territorial dispute perhaps with another bird and got the short end of that deal. And uh, But now ready to go again. So. We're all, all right, well, cool. I guess uh, take the little hood off. <laughs> I'm no eagle expert, but I bet we <laughs> take the hood off. Yeah, you could do it. Just do it that direction. You know. Can I just pull it straight off? Yeah, quickly as you can. There we go. See? Um, Boy, the eyes are amazing. <laughs> oh. We're going to give him a second just to adjust to see where he is.
Oh my gosh. Boy, they are awesome. Uh, that white stands out on the trees. Looks like it's flying. Wow, that's a nice bank a there. <laughs> yeah, look at that. So I'll give this back to you. Yeah, thank you. We'll Guys, that time. was awesome. I mean, that was just yeah. incredible. Yeah, he, uh, he did well. I'm so appreciative of the work you guys are doing here. Education, rehab, this is an amazing place. And well, thanks thank for letting you us join you today. Here. So this is an eagle that fell out of a nest. In fact, its nest is right up there. It's about 80 feet high or something like that. And the animal actually fell and was tangled in some Spanish moss and hung there for some time until we had some really strong winds that blew it out of the nest. And we were able to scoop it up, take it back to the Nature Center. Now it's important to note that we work very closely with South Carolina Department of Natural Resources and the Center for Birds of Prey in Allendaw to see if we could help this bird. Veterinarian Dr. Al Seegers did a physical examination and gave the bird fluids, and we were also able to get it to eat a meal. Now this is a really young bird. Um, it's only about four weeks old, and, but boy, look at the feet. Look at those talons. And of course, quite a, a bill on it. This bill as an adult would be kind of a yellow color and the feet would be even more bright yellow, but spectacular talons. Of course, these are good for grasping fish and, and other prey. I think it's, the bird seems to be really in pretty good shape. Now let's see what we can do to get this bird back in the nest. So we have our eagle in the box, and Bluff and Fire Department has graciously agreed to take us up to return this bird. Uh, so the idea is to get it back in the nest. We think there's another chick in there, and the adults are really spending a lot of time flying around, so this could be kind of exciting. So we're headed up to put this bird back in the nest. I tell you what, it's a little, <laughs> I know you're used to this, but it's a little higher than I'm used to, that's for sure. This thing is probably eight feet across or something like that. So we're on the edge of the nest and we're just kind of looking. There's all kinds of guano and stuff in the birds, but if you look right here, that's the tail of a stingray. I thought it was a snake at first, but here's that spine. So obviously these eagles have been eating stingrays. There we go. So we've got, we've got the bird in. There's already a chick in there. So uh, we hear mom and dad coming around. So I think we probably better get on down. <laughs> so we're headed back down. We hope it's going to be okay. There's always the chance that the other chick may have pushed it out or maybe out competing this bird. We hope that that's not the case, but we'll kind of deal with that if we need to. Anyway, hope this story ends well, but I'll tell you what, this is awesome. So here we are back at the eagle nest, and if you look, you can see one animal that's directly above the nest, and then there's one kind of peeking over the right side, it looks like. So these animals have grown considerably. In fact, one of them is kind of standing up, facing into the wind, and flapping its wings, presumably to strengthen those flight muscles. Uh, these guys look really good. Since eagles are pretty common around here, I think we have a real tendency to kind of take them for granted. But we have to remember, this is a species that came perilously close to extinction. I would tell you what, it's really good to see these guys up and ready to take flight. And I look forward to seeing them flying around in the skies of the Lowcountry. Thanks for joining us on Coastal Kingdom.